Alrighty, everyone. Well, this morning's topic we're going to talk about uh, a little bit. Um, <clears throat> it has many different ways that it might go. I'm never certain when I sit down where it's going to go. But it usually goes where it needs to go. And the title that came to me is It Starts With You. It Starts With You. And there's bookends on that statement. There's it at the beginning and there's you at the end. <clears throat> so in order for that topic to make any sense at all, we have to some come to some type of understanding of what it is. And we have to come to some type of understanding of what we mean by you. Who am I? St. Paul said, who am I that God is mindful of me? Who am I? What am I? What is this thing called you? <clears throat> Ernest Holmes uh, wrote a book called This Thing Called You. Very good, if, if anybody can get a hold of it. This Thing Called You. And what, what kind of came to me as, as, we, as I started this, as, as the ideas for, um, for what we would discuss this morning came about, is that if we look at, at the, the main areas of life, of, of human life, of living on this planet Earth, if we look at those main main areas of interest, if, if we want to call them that, for, for lack of a better way of describing it, you know, perhaps generative themes would be another way, you know, what, where, where is our energy? Where is our attention? Where is our focus? What are the things that are important to us in life? They tend to fall into <clears throat> certain general categories. And I realize that these are general and there may be exceptions. But in general, and, and this is something that we, we went over in ministerial school. So typically if somebody comes to uh, a practitioner or a minister, and they have a request, something something that they would like to, to have treatment work done for. Where you know we used to have the little wooden box there in Wilmington, and people would fill out cards and drop them in the box. <clears throat> and generally, the requests fall into certain categories. The first being health. The second being wealth. The third being relationships. <clears throat> the fourth being creative self-expression or fulfilling work, those sorts of things. And typically the last was spiritual attunement, spiritual practice, spiritual growth, spiritual discipline. Now, I only put it last, not because it's least important. I think as we go through this, we'll see that that, that actually should be first. But because generally that's where it winds up. You know, if so, so if we took a hundred cards out of the box and, and kind of, <coughs> excuse me, kind of looked at them, the number of requests uh, dealing with spiritual attunement would be the fewest of the whole bunch. The rest would kind of even out through through those other categories. And of course, there's there's kind of like peaks and valleys. You know, some some months it's prosperity issues, and <laughs> April fifteenth <laughs> kind of thing, and other months it's it's kind of health, and uh, <clears throat> February it's relationships. There's kind of themes, you know, themes that go go through our lives. So what this means is is that in general, in generalistic terms, we as human beings, we desire something different. We desire a different experience. That is the it. What is this it that we're talking about? The it that we're talking about is life. It is life. And it is the things that life are made up of, our health, our prosperity, our relationships, our fulfilling activities, our creative self-expression, our spiritual practice. This is the very stuff that life is made of. It begins with you. It. So, so the very stuff, the very substance, the very, the very, <laughs> very essence of the experience of human life on this plane of existence it all begins with you. It all begins with you. 
Now we flip to the other end. We flip to the you and say, what is this you? That it, who is this you? What is this you that it depends on? What, what am I? Who am I? And I want to give you a, kind of a visual, you know, a, an image that you can take away. Vernon Howard was um, a unity minister down in Atlanta, and he wrote a book called Psychopictography. Psychopictography. Kind of a long name, but, but it was, it's a very interesting book if you can find a copy of it. <clears throat> and his whole point was that we remember the, the image long after we've forgotten the words. And this is why teachers of old taught in parables, you know. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie in the green pastures beside the still waters. We can see that. We can see the sheep. We can see them by the babbling brook. We can see the lush green grass, you know. We get it. We get it. So long after we've forgotten the words, we have that, that image. And what Vernon Howard's whole book was, it was just like uh, 120 or 150 short little parables, but each one designed to leave a lasting image, a lasting impression in our minds. So that as we, as we go away from reading the book, or as we go away from listening to a, a Sunday talk, we take, take that image with us. So the image I'd like you to consider is this one. Um, when I go to the TV studio, when I volunteer down at the TV studio to work, of course, when we get there, it's just an empty room. That, that's all it is. It's an empty room. And there are tracks around that go all the way around the area where the cameras will be. <clears throat> and there are different layers of curtains on those tracks. And one of the first things that we do is, is we pull the curtain that we're going to use for whatever the particular show happens to be. And each producer might want a different, different curtain. We pull that curtain so that it, it's going to be the backdrop for the camera. So when the cameras are shooting at the, at the talent, at the subjects who are talking in the background is whatever color they want. There's a black curtain. There's a blue curtain. There's a green curtain from when we're doing chroma keying, you know, like, like the weather people have the weather map. It looks like it's behind them, but it's not. They're really standing in front of a green screen. And then there's a white curtain. And, of course, it's a matter of preference as to which, which one the producer wants to use, what they're doing that day. But the interesting thing about the white curtains is it can be white, of course. That's what it is. But we have these, we call them gels, and, and what it is, it is a, a tinted piece of plastic that covers the lights. So what we do is we shine white lights onto that curtain so that the curtain is, you know, illuminated in the shot. And then we can take these different colored gels, just clip on with clothespins over the front of the light. And we can project onto that curtain any tint we want depending upon the color of the gel. So if we put a rose colored gel over the lights, suddenly this white curtain becomes a rose colored background. So these gels are like the filters for the light. The light in itself is pure white light. The gel <clears throat> alters that light as it goes through. And the, and the remaining light, or the resulting light that comes past that gel and onto the curtain, now has a reflection of the tint of the gel. In other words, the experience of the curtain that we get when we're looking at the curtain, we no longer see the curtain as it is. We see the curtain through the filter, through the tint of the filter through the alteration of the filter. Now you and I are the filters, each and every one of us. The pure light is God. The life of God that is shining through us, that is shining as us, that has created us out of itself. That is the pure light, that is the pure essence of what we are. And if you if you go back and you read the the experiences of mystics of every culture, not just Christian mystics or Jewish mystics or Buddhist mystics, any culture, 
Native Americans, uh, <clears throat> Indians up north, Inuits up north, in the deserts of Africa. The experience is the same. The experience that we have when we start to enter that, which is called the mystical, sometimes it's called cosmic consciousness, sometimes it might be called super consciousness, depending upon the culture that you're in. The experience is that of a blinding light. <clears throat> A light that is described as more brilliant than 10,000 suns, more brilliant than 10,000 bolts of lightning, but yet it is cool, it does not burn. It is a bright illuminance, but the heat is gone. The heat is not there. You remember the story of Moses going up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments and he had the burning bush experience? And it was the fire that burned, but did not consume. The mystical experience. So the you and the we that we are, we are normally living on the other side of the filter. We are living life viewed as altered by the filter. The filter being our ego, the filter being our intellect the filter being our prejudices, our opinions, our background, our education, our experience. All of those things kind of kind of go into the filter and and they make it unique. So my filter is different than yours. Your filter is different than your significant other. See, we are all viewing life, but we're not viewing life as it is. We are viewing life as we are. Sometimes when we work from the teachings of Buddhism, there's, there's, um, there's a teaching that says, what we want to do is we want to experience life as it is. Experience life as it is. We want to see things as they are. And sometimes I find that people have a hard time with that because they say, well, if I look at the way things are, you know, there's, there's a lot of bad things in this world. Are you, are you telling me that, you know, that I just need to accept things the way they are? You know, that bad things will continue, that people will kill one another, all those things. And I say, no, that's not what the teaching says. What you're seeing is, is you're seeing things through the filter. That's not the truth of them. That is not the reality of their experience. That is the way they appear to be. We don't want to judge by appearances. This is what the New Testament tells us, that don't judge by appearances. Judge by the righteous judgment. What is the righteous judgment? You know, it is that unfiltered light. It is that pure essence of God that is the life that animates us. So you, you and I, we didn't create ourselves. We know that. Nor did, <clears throat> did this thing called our soul come into being compelled by the physical, compelled by the generation of the body. But that which we are, the you, the you that we are, the, the you that you are, is that pure essence of the light of God that is unfiltered, that is unfiltered. So what we come back to then is, is flipping back and forth between these bookends. What we come back to is the it, the it that we are experiencing. The health, the wealth, the relationships, the fulfilling activities, meaningful work, you know, our spiritual attunement. The it that we are currently experiencing starts with us, starts with you, starts with me, because it is a reflection of what we are expecting to see. We experience life not as it is, but as we are. It starts with you. If, if we can 
accept that. See, it's a big responsibility. I was reading some of Eric Butterworth this morning. He says, it's a big responsibility. People don't want to accept the responsibility that the experience that they are having is a result of their consciousness. It's easier to, to blame all of our troubles on someone else and something else, you know. It's easier to think of ourselves as, as you know, a victim. We are this way because our parents were this way, you know. We, <clears throat> we are experiencing financial difficulties because the economy is bad, see. Our job really stinks, but jobs are supposed to stink, so, so why complain too much about it, you know. I've been completely unlucky in love. Oh, my goodness, you know. Just everybody else seems to have good luck. For some reason, I just, I just seem to pick all the wrong people. And it's easier to just look out there and give all of our power away. And what we are saying is, is that our sense of well-being, our sense of good, our sense of satisfaction, our sense of fulfillment, all depends on someone else. All depends on something outside of ourselves. And I think what happens is our society teaches us that. You can see that right now. If you, you turn on the news, you can see that right now. Every time somebody in, in the public eye gets into trouble, it's somebody else's fault. So, you know, somebody else did it. They're just a poor victim of, of somebody else. That's, that's what they'll tell you when, when they want to <clears throat> uh, absolve themselves of any responsibility. In the very next sentence, they'll tell you how bright and smart and talented they are, and powerful and things like that. But when it comes to whatever that previous issue was, they're just totally, totally the victim of somebody else. So we give all of our power away. And, and what we tend to do in our society is as soon as we get to the point where we find someone else to blame, we stop looking. Usually we stop looking. Why did this happen? Well, somebody screwed up. Oh, oh, okay. So I'm sure that you took care of that. <clears throat> Let's move along. And, and of course, it's that doesn't make things better. It just it just moves things around. So our society kind of tells us that it's okay. It's okay to to play the victim when it gets us out of responsibility and accountability but but life doesn't work that way our spiritual life doesn't work that way see there's 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 nobody else to blame it starts with you the experience that you're having is a reflection of your consciousness <laughs> not somebody else's consciousness I just I just chuckle I, I remember the line from from uh, Woody Allen he said that he failed metaphysics in college because he got caught peeking into the soul of the girl next to him. We can't get somebody to come into our soul and do it for us. We can get people to help us along the way. We can get people to teach us along the way. We can help other people and we can teach them along the way. But no one else, no one else can do for us what God created us to do for ourselves. So we tend to sit back. We tend to sit back for, for two reasons. One, it's, it's easier to blame somebody else. It's easier to say, well, I'm having these difficulties in life because God must want me to have them. It's easier to do that than to accept responsibility and to go, go into the only place that we can to have a different experience, to go within. And the other reason I think that, that people in general stay stuck is they get comfortable in their stuckness. They get comfortable being stuck. They're used to it. It's familiar. You know? it's, it's the boiled frog syndrome that we talked about in motivational seminars. You put, you put the frog in the water and turn the heat up slowly and it doesn't notice until it gets lethargic and can't escape. As opposed to if you just drop the frog down into hot water, it would jump out immediately 
And of course, it's only a teaching story. No frogs were harmed in the making of this sermon. But we get used to we get used to the, the, the things the way they are. And it's easier for us to continue to continue on <clears throat> with things being the way they are than it is for us to get busy doing what it is that we need to do to change. When I was um, working in uh, in programs with uh, addictions, you know, they they have something in uh, in the programs that they call kissing the pavement, kissing the pavement. And what they mean by that is, is the person with the addiction had gotten so low that they kissed the pavement. They, they, there was no place lower to go. That was the point where, where the addict, the person with the addiction, started to, to turn their life around, started to say, this has got to stop. I've got to do something different. Other people go and get a cardboard box and live on the pavement. So we get comfortable. We get comfortable with things as they are. And it's very hard to to kind of suddenly go back and say, well, why are we accepting this? Why are, why are we settling? Why are we, as Emmett Fox, I think it was, says, why are we the prince who's living like a beggar in his own country? And our religions give us lots of, lots of <clears throat> excuses, lots of explanations. It's that way because God wants it to be that way. See, God is sending sickness. God is sending poverty. God is sending all these things to teach people a lesson. God is sending war to punish its enemies. All these kinds of things that, that <clears throat> traditional religions tell us that we have to go back and ask ourselves, is that so? Is that so? Or is that the filter of the religion? See? Is that the gel over the light that the religion <clears throat> is projecting onto the pure white curtain? Could that which is absolute perfection know imperfection? Could that which is, has created us out of itself know that we need to be punished? Could it know that we need to learn anything? Could it want anything for us other than it wants for itself? A greater expression of life, a new experience, a new experience as us, a new experience through us. So here are some, some of the ways that we kind of give that power away. I, and I just want to toss these out. Because w what it comes down to for us is something that Dr. Holmes says, you know. We must persistently and painstakingly, persistently and painstakingly, eliminate every idea in our consciousness which is unlike the truth of God. We've got to remove the gels. We've got to remove the filters. We've got to get past, past the ideas that tell us that sickness is normal, that poverty comes in cycles, that relationships are hard, that work was never meant to be fulfilling. And we have to get to our spiritual attunement, which tells us that all of those ideas are wrong. All of those ideas are wrong. So what does your health depend on? What does your health really depend on? We say diet, we say exercise, we say genes, and all of those things probably have some factor. But where does your health come from? Who is the author of your health? Who is the creator of your body? And we want to work, we want to pay attention to what we're, we're thinking. We want to pay attention to what we're saying. Because what we say reveals what we believe. And how many times will people say, oh, you know, well, my parent had that, my father had that, my mother had that, so I guess I'm going to have that too, whatever that happens to be, you know. Really? Or are you condemned by your genes? Or is genetic disposition more of a tendency? If it's a tendency, then why isn't it always true? Why is it only sometimes true? But the important thing is it doesn't have to be true. You see, it doesn't have to be true. 
But what that reveals to you is, is that you were put your faith in genetics and your faith belongs in God. Doesn't mean, I'm not saying that we don't eat well or exercise, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that we do it from a totally different viewpoint, a totally different orientation. We're not trying to struggle to get health, but we are celebrating the perfect health that is within us. We are letting it express itself through us as joyful activity. We take in the food that is appropriate for our bodies. We start with our spiritual practice of divine guidance leads me this day, shows me this day, encourages me this day to do and to eat that which ought to be done as me. There's an intelligence in my body that knows perfectly well how to absorb what it needs to absorb today and how to eliminate what ought to be eliminated today. And I trust that guidance. See, when we sit down to bless food, as a child, my idea of blessing was that somehow there was a power, almost a magical power, that could be conveyed onto a person or onto an object, onto a, onto a religious artifact, a medal or something that I would then hang around my neck. We would take it to, to the church to have it blessed. And there was there were signs, you know, the, the priest would move his move his hands or sprinkle holy water and these outward signs. And as a small child observing these things, I, I, I got the impression that somehow there was a power that was being trans transmitted through the actions of the priest into this into this medallion. When we said grace over food, when when we blessed our food, it was it was kind of like we were invoking some type of a power to come down and make it holy, you know. But that was a child's view. That was a child's view of the world. That was a filter that I was looking through at that time. But to me, blessing means recognizing the presence and the activity of God. That's what it means today. We're told pray for our enemies. You know, and, and I think that gets distorted that Sometimes we want to pray for our enemies to, to be just like us, to, to see the light just like us, to be converted to our religion, to be converted to our way of thinking. I don't think that's what it means at all. Can we see the presence of God within them in spite, in spite of their behavior? When we, when we bless food, we're not putting anything into the food that's not already there. What we are doing is opening our consciousness to the realization of the presence and the activity of God in that food. Our bodies could not digest the food if there wasn't something <clears throat> similar, something alike between the two. And what is it that is alike between the two, but it is the activity of God? The activity of God that took the seed and grew the tomato plant is the activity of God that takes the tomato plant and turns it into the cells, the organs, the tissues of this body. You see, we start to bring ourselves into this awareness. And where do we do this? See, where do we do this? Do we do this out there? We do this the only place we can, in here. It starts with you. You have to go within. I can't come and wave my hand over your food and make it any more than it is or make it any less than it is. You have to have that experience. So we examine our lives and we say, well, what, what does our good in the form of supply depend upon? The money, the materials, the goods, the services, all of these different things that are appropriate for, <clears throat> for our life today. What does it depend upon? Does it depend upon the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index? Does it depend upon the state of the economy? <clears throat> what does it depend upon? And in the human sense, it does. In the human sense, we have an opinion in our society that, that money depends upon hard work, 
people who don't have money, well, they just don't work hard enough. And people, people who have lots and lots and lots of money, well, they work very hard. And of course, if you look around, that's not true at all. That is absolutely not true at all. Some of the richest people in the world do nothing, do very little. Some of the hardest working people in the world have very little. But our culture tells us that because it serves our culture well. But what does your good depend upon? What does your experience of flow and supply and money depend upon? And it depends upon nothing else than your connection with God. The divine takes the invisible energy of the universe and turns it into whatever form as is appropriate for its expression of life. And it is no more difficult to produce a hundred dollar bill than a planet or a star. But as Emma Curtis Hopkins tells us, <clears throat> we believe that we have to eat our bread by the sweat of our brow. We believe that we have to work hard for our money. And until we grow in spiritual consciousness, until we develop our spiritual consciousness, until our spiritual attunement comes first rather than last, we will continue to do so. She tells us the day will come that humans will not work for their money, but their money will flow through their consciousness, through their connection with God. So what are your attitudes towards money? And how do they reflect upon your spiritual attunements? <laughs> we think of relationships. <clears throat> John Randolph Price tells us, if you're, looking at, if you're looking at money issues in your life, go to your relationships first. Because your relationships are a perfect indicator of your beliefs and your beliefs that will affect the flow of money through you. Are you giving? Are you a giving person in your relationships? Are you a jealous person in your relationships? Are you a controlling person in your relationships? See, all of those things are signals. So we come, we come to this idea then of, of relationships and we say, well, what, what are we talking about first of all? Are we talking about romantic relationships? Are we talking about work relationships? Are we talking parent-child relationships? Are we talking friend relationships? What kind of relationships are we talking about? Co-workers, all those things. And we're talking about all of those. We're talking about all of those. See, what is a relationship? What is a relationship but, but two or more individualized expressions of God coming together? My relationships are a perfect reflection of my own consciousness. You ever seen, seen folks, Chris, not you, didn't happen to you, I'm sure, but you probably know somebody. You know, they go from one relationship to another relationship to another relationship, and over time they all look the same. They have a job, and the job starts to go sour, and they quit that job, and they move to another company. <clears throat> and for the first couple months or a couple years, it's all, all wonderful, but after a while it starts to take on the same characteristics of the last job. <clears throat> They're in one romantic relationship, and something goes sour, and they move on to another romantic relationship, and after a while the same issues start to arise. No matter where you go, there you are. You're bringing your consciousness with you. So when we come to recognize that that it, our relationships, start with you and that you is, is, the, <laughs> is the you that experiences God and expresses God without the filter, without this, the, the prejudices, without the fears, without the doubts, without the worries, then we can start to have different kinds of relationships. And work is a big one for a lot of people. Work is a big one. The idea that we can be fulfilled in our work and that we can do our work whether, whether our income depended upon it or not. We can do a labor of love and not have to, not have to work hard for our money. It's pretty foreign for a lot of people, that idea particularly in our culture, which tells us that you ought to work hard if you want to get paid. You, you need to work hard for your money. But you see that idea that you need to work hard for your money and that, and that work is not supposed to be joyful. And that work is something that you have to put up with to get money 
<laughs> I always say, work is something that you don't want to do, that you do to get money so that you can go do what you want to do. That's that's what we think we're doing. Yeah, I really don't like this job, but it pays the bills and gives me the money to go out and do what it is that I really want to do. And we have to recognize that that is a filter. God didn't make it that way. We made it that way. And we have to let go of that filter. The divine did not create us to work in misery. It created us to express its life joyfully. So when we go back and we look at the it of life, the things that life are made up of, what are our attitudes towards health? What are our attitudes towards money? What are our attitudes towards relationship? And what are our attitudes towards work? We see that in many cases we start off with wanting to fix something, wanting to fix something that is broken. My health is not where I want it to be. I'd like to fix that. My my checkbook is not where I want it to be. I'd like to fix that. My relationships are certainly not where I want them to be. I'd like to fix that. And, oh, God, please take this job. Take this job away from me. Let's fix that. And it's a, that is a normal starting place. You see, you have to start where we, we are. We, we all have to start where we are. You have to start where you are. I have to start where I am. We have to start right where we are. That's another thing that we trick ourselves into doing. Say, I'm going to start from over there. No, you can't start from over there. You're not over there. You're over here. You know, you got to start where you are. So, so Goldsmith calls this, we try to bring God down into our human experience. We enter into our spiritual life thinking, well, somehow I am going to to manipulate God, see. That God sent me this this problem, but if I talk really nice to God, then God will take the problem away from me. That kind of pretty much, if you look at our traditional concepts of prayer, that pretty much covers it, you know. So what Joel tells us is, can, you can imagine you're going into the lobby of a skyscraper in a big city. And there's a bank of elevators that, you know, some of the elevators go up 10 floors and then the next elevator goes up from floors 11 through 20 and so on. There's different banks of elevators and you have to go to whatever bank is going to take you to the floor you want to go to. And you press the button and you get on the elevator. But what happens as the elevator goes up? See, it's not like the elevator stands still and the building comes down to you. The elevator goes up. And what Goldsmith tells us is, is that we spend much of our time trying to bring down, bring God down into our level to fix our human problems. We want, we want a better human experience. The it that we want is a better human experience. And of course, Janis Joplin sang so well, you know, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? How hard can it be? Just give me the six numbers for the lottery. How hard can it be? And that's okay. Sometimes we have to start there. We have to start with something that we think is broken and we want to fix, but as we move into our spiritual attunement, what Dr. Holmes tells us is, is that with all you're getting, you have to get God. You can't, you can't get a healing unless you get a different concept of God. You can't get um, financial prosperity unless you get a different concept of God as the abundance of the universe flowing through you. You can't get better relationships unless you recognize it, that the people you're in relationship are the very essence of God. You can't, you can't, get a better job, a more fulfilling job, but unless you recognize that your work is love and expression. See? It's the very activity of God. Of course it's fulfilling. So we move through a phase of, of thinking the it that we want is, is to repair that which is broken. And then we go into the phase of saying, oh, no, what we want is we want to express even more of it. My health is good, but I would like it to be even better. I'd like it to be even better, you know. Maybe I want to run that marathon. Maybe I want to climb that mountain. 
whatever it happens to be, it's good, but I want it to be better, and I bless it. Maybe, maybe the supply of money in my life is good, but I want more so I can, I can participate in some greater work. I want to invest in something. I want to, I want to share in something. I want to give away something. You know, maybe my relationships are good, but I want them to be even better. You know, as Osho tells us, we want to rise in love. We don't want to fall in love. We want to rise in love. We want to let love <clears throat> help us to to transcend, to transmute our humanness, to realize more of our divinity, and to recognize that in each other. Maybe our work is fulfilling, but we want to find a way for it to be even more fulfilling or to multiply it and to share it so that it is fulfilling for others. Maybe we want to create a business or a work opportunity <clears throat> where people can come to be fulfilled rather than come to, to labor. You know, So we move through that phase then of creation. We don't want to fix something that's broken. We want to create something even better. And our filter starts to change. The light that's shining on the white curtain now has a different hue. We're starting to see things differently. We're starting to see the opportunities. We're starting to see the magnificence of God in each and every one, in each and everything. Now we are truly blessing everything all the time. See? And then what that brings us to is the experience of God. At some point in our growth, the it, the it that starts with us is the burning desire for the experience of the presence of God. There's nothing left to fix. There's nothing important to create. We only want to experience the presence of God. We are like Rumi tells us, that moth that wants to fly into the flame, even though its body be destroyed, for that moment of sheer ecstasy of experiencing the union of the divine presence. So the it, the it that we want has to start within us. It starts with a desire. The divine has already placed the desire to be with it in our hearts. Aquinas tells us we wouldn't have the desire to pray if God hadn't already put it here. And the next step is a decision. I'm going to do this. I'm going to dedicate everything that I am and everything that I have to my spiritual attunement. See, that which we had put last now comes first. Because if we had the spiritual attunement going from the get-go, everything else, the health, the wealth, the love, the self-expression, all would have fallen into place. Those would have been the signs following. And it takes a surrender. It takes an acceptance. Are we willing to take the filters that we've had over the divine light, the gels that were held on by clothespins? Are we willing to cast them aside and say, I don't need these anymore. I don't want these anymore. Everything that I have ever known may be wrong. Every opinion that I have ever held may be wrong. Everything that I ever possessed is not worth having in comparison to the experience of presence of God. I am willing to release it all. I am willing to let it all go. I am willing to, to step alone and naked into the presence, into the love. It has to start with you. 
No one else can desire to know God for you. No one else can de- decide to know God for you. No one else can surrender the ego, the intellect, the materialism, <clears throat> the opinions, the bigotry, the prejudices that we have. But you. So I invite you this day, I invite you this week, please take time, please take time. Go into your meditation. Go into your meditation and let everything that is unlike God leave you. The visualization that works for me is the one that we get in the, in the Bible many times, and it, it you know it's kind of casting gold into the furnace, and we put the gold ore into the furnace, and it it starts to glow, and it starts to get very hot, and it starts to shine brightly, and what happens is the dross bubbles off, the impurities right, rise away, they bubble off, and all that is left is the pure gold. And I get this image of of a figure, a human figure, almost like the Oscar statue, you know. That is me. That is me standing in in that burning bush, you know, in that in that bright, bright light. That doesn't hurt me, but it it, it transcends changes, it dissolves everything in me that is unlike the pure essence of the presence of God. So I invite you this week to consider that this is the opportunity to use life as your spiritual practice. Examine your your beliefs about health, about money, about relationships, about work, about your spiritual attunement. If necessary, decide to make your spiritual attunement first. Don't get comfortable in the fact that, well, I know how to do things the ordinary way. The ordinary way is not good enough anymore. From this moment, we live our lives as spiritual beings. Try it. See what happens. There's a quote that's attributed to Deepak Chopra. I'm not certain that he was the original author, but it's widely attributed to him. And it says that religion is a belief in someone else's experience. Spirituality is having your own experience. We don't want religion. It's good until we have our own experience. But we never want to stop at religion. We want to step into the presence of God, into the experience of the presence of God. And that is the it that starts with you. And so it is.